It's been over 900 days since the Federal Reserve first hiked interest rates in response to surging inflation, embarking on one of the most aggressive policy tightening journeys in history. Now, two and a half years and 525 basis points later, the Fed has changed direction and begun cutting interest rates. We're going to get into the details and what it means for investors right now on UBS Trending. Hi, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. Thank you so much for being here on this historic day. We are joined today by my guest, Ron Temple, Chief Market Strategist at Lazard. Ron, nice to have you here in the studio. Great to be here. Thank you. So just so the audience knows, we're literally sitting here about two hours after the Fed decided to cut rates by 50 basis points, which I think going into this, people, uh, economists, and you and I included, were kind of saying, well, is it going to be 25? Is it going to be 50? They ultimately went for 50. Lots came out in the statement. But just first take. Digest what you heard from Fair, uh, Fed Chair Powell and what you saw in the statement. Well, I think this was an unusual Fed meeting because usually they go into the meeting having telegraphed what they're going to do with a pretty firm conviction of what the right policy choice is. In this case, I think there was probably a lot of active discussion actually at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. Um, what they ultimately decided to do, as you said, is cut rates 50 basis points. And the reason they did that is it was interesting. In the press conference, Chair Powell was asked, you know, if you had had the job number for July when you had the July 31st Fed meeting, would you have cut rates? Mm. And he said, if we had had that data, we might have done it. We probably would have done it. So I think what you saw today with the 50 basis points is the Fed saying with the incremental data they've gotten about the economy, maybe things had eased a bit more in terms of tightness of the labor market. They knew inflation had come down. And maybe in hindsight, they should have started easing. So just to give you a sense of a couple of the data points I watch on the labor market front, um, number one is the unemployment rate. It bottomed at 3.4 percent about two uh, in the last year. Uh, that was the lowest unemployment since 1969. We're now at 4.2 percent. So again, just keep in mind, the reason I point out it was the lowest since 1969 is that is an incredibly tight labor market. It's a little less tight now. Right. The other metric is the number of unfilled jobs per unemployed person. We peaked at two open jobs per unemployed person. We're now down to 1.1. In fact, Jay Powell cited that in the press conference. And the reason those matter, by the way, is the Fed has two mandates, price stability, i.e. avoiding too much inflation, and maximum employment. They've done such a good job lowering inflation. A lot of the conversation today at the press conference was, are you behind the curve? Is the labor market getting too weak too quickly? And I think what we found is the Fed basically wanted to be a bit aggressive and buy an insurance policy to make sure the labor market doesn't ease too much. Right. And look, Powell also added that he didn't want to fall behind. Um, and I think going to what you're talking about here, were they too late to the party? But he said we didn't want to fall behind, so we went the full 50 basis points, which ahead of the decision, some pundits and, uh, you know, television personalities were saying that might just be considered too aggressive. But then we looked at the statement, and if you look at what he talked about, the summary of economic projections, which we were just joking beforehand, he usually says, don't look at that. But he said, look at that. And it right. looks like between the 50 today and all of next year into 2025, they're expecting a total of 200 basis points, which also aligns with our chief investment office's economist here. So it's interesting to see that he kind of got up to speed with today's decision, it seems anyway. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think the hard part about the 50 basis points, coming into this meeting, I thought 50 basis points was the right thing to do, but I did not think they would do it. Right. And the primary reason was one of the fears amongst economists and strategists was if they did cut by 50, would it scare the market? Would it make people think something's wrong with the economy that the Fed knows and I don't know? But I think they really walked that tightrope pretty masterfully. As you said, in that summary of economic projections, very importantly, they only showed one or two more 25 basis point rate cuts by the end of this year. So they made it clear that they're not going to do 50 at each meeting. So again, they're not hitting the panic button. Right. And to your point about the 200 basis points, that also means rates end up at around three and a quarter to three and a half percent at the bottom of the easing cycle, which is roughly where I've been expecting it. And that basically says to you, again, as Jay Powell said in the press conference, they don't see any imminent signs of a downturn. They don't see risk of a recession. They just want to optimize that they have two mandates, maximum employment and price stability, 
They've largely accomplished the price stability. Now they got to focus on making sure they get as many jobs created as they can. That's right. And then you know, the re recession question certainly has been coming up. And you just pointed out that it doesn't seem, based on what we heard today, that Powell or the FOMC is fearful of that. That's not why they're making these decisions. What are your thoughts on the recession word that people are asking? Are we in one? Is one imminent? You know, how does it look in your projections? Now, I would never admit this on live TV, obviously, because I clearly never driven a car 90 miles per hour. But imagine you're driving. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> imagine you're driving a car 90 miles per hour and you slow down to 60. It feels like you're going slow. Well, to me, that's what's been happening in the economy. We have been firing on all cylinders for the last two years. Real GDP growth in the U.S. has been 2.5% per annum last year and this year. This quarter, it's running at a pace of nearly 3%, according to some estimates. That is well above the speed limit, you might say, for the U.S. economy. Most economists would say we can grow 1.7 to 2% a year. So I think what you're seeing in the economy right now is that inevitable slowing towards a more sustainable growth rate, partly because the Fed raised rates a lot, but also because when we came out of the pandemic, people had an enormous amount of savings that they had accumulated when they couldn't travel and couldn't go to restaurants. And so basically people have spent down a lot of the savings. Rates being high for two years has made a big difference in terms of debt sustainability. And what you're seeing is an economy going from very strong to strong. Mm -hmm. I don't see meaningful signs of recession. There are some signs of fragility. Make no mistake, there always are. I'll watch those carefully. But I think right now it's a pretty low probability risk of recession over the next 12 to 18 months. Right. And I guess that begs the next question. You sort of brought it up there is for the average investor or the average consumer, they're like, OK, great. What's in it for me? Um, because people have been certainly concerned about high mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get a car loan that's, you know, at a, at a reasonable rate. And people are wondering, when is that going to change on the Main Street side? Any thoughts on what that, because obviously when the Fed cuts rates, it's like buying gas at the gas station, just because the price per barrel is lower, doesn't mean right. it automatically happens at the pump. Same kind of situation here with rates from the Fed. When do, when do consumers and investors start to see that? Yeah, it really depends on which consumer you are. If you're yeah. a consumer, typically at the lower end of the income threshold and the lower end of the income spectrum in the U.S., you might have credit card debt. That debt might actually see your interest rate go down right away because in many cases, it's set off of a floating rate. Um, if you have a mortgage, as you know, 90% plus of Americans have a fixed rate mortgage. That's so right. that rate's not going to change. So don't hold your breath. But if you're looking to buy a home, if you're a first-time home buyer, you know, mortgage rates peaked at 7.8% late last year. They're now down to 6.2%. I do not think you should count on those rates necessarily coming down more because they are not based on Fed funds. They're based on the long end of the yield curve, which has already moved down pretty materially. So, so bottom line is I think the bigger impact is on companies. It's on people with floating rate debt. It should free up extra money for more consumption, which leads to more job growth and a stronger economy. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Powell even made a comment in the press conference about the housing market saying essentially that. It's like the housing market is not really going to move that much because so many people are already locked in at fairly low rates, um, you know, or actually any rates. But I know refinancing a few years ago, some people were getting three, three and a half percent. And, and so no one's going to budge if they're paying three and a half percent mortgage for their home. Yeah, about 60 percent of Americans have a mortgage rate of four percent or less. Right. So so no one, you know, there may be a few really unlucky people who borrowed at 775 and now can refinance and maybe they should look into it. But bottom line, for most people, they're not going to see a big effect on that front. Right. So let's look at the sort of the way forward as we're rounding out our conversation today, Ron. Um, it sounds like from what you're saying and the digesting of what the Fed did and what Powell said, that there's some optimism about the economy moving forward. Um, and you said it doesn't seem like from what they're saying that we're headed for a recession. I mean, there are no guarantees, but we also don't think we're headed for a recession here in our chief investment office. Is there anything that could upset that apple cart. We have an election coming. We know that that's pretty tenuous and it's a close race. Um, da data itself is not linear. We could see inflation spike or jobs go in another different direction. What do you think about the state of the economy as we move forward? Well, well the things I'm watching to see if I'm wrong about my optimism is really the labor market first and yeah. foremost. And, and the reason I say that is in the last three months, so June, July, August, the average job creation was 116,000 jobs per month. That is materially lower than what we've experienced for the prior two years. And we'll need to see if there was maybe an anomaly. There was a hurricane in the South. There were other factors that could play into that. But bottom line is I'm going to be watching the labor market to see if easing of tightness turns into outright weakness. And, you know, it's a gray zone there. Mm. But when I look at the broader economy, we got retail sales this week that were better than expected. 
We had some better data from the Empire in, in Manufacturing Index. So we're seeing good data across companies. Earnings reports are very good. The S&P 500 equal weighted index hit a new all-time high yesterday. Um, credit markets look very healthy. So a lot of things look good on the dashboard. And one last thing, I mean, one negative I am also watching from a longer term structural mm. perspective is government deficits. And I do think regardless of who wins this election, they will continue to be very high because neither party has put out a credible plan to reduce them. But as much as people tend to look at deficits and say negative things about the U.S., I would like to remind them of one thing. We are by far the richest country in the world. If you look at household net worth in the U.S., it's over $163 trillion. Now, again, total government debt outstanding, something on the order of $34 trillion. Households have net worth, again, assets minus debt of $163 trillion. It's never been higher. It's well above double the levels after the global financial crisis. So, again, this is a country with a lot of wealth, a strong job market, inflation that's come down materially. It's a pretty good starting point as you look into 2025 in terms of growth. I love that sense of optimism. Ron, thank you very much. Good to have you. Ron Temple from Lazard. Thanks for coming. Come back again. We'd love to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. And thank you all for joining us. For more information from our best partners like Lazard and our own chief investment office, please visit our Insights website. That address is UBS.com forward slash views. Plus, you can follow UBS on Instagram and all the major channels. You can also follow our studio at UBS Trending is that Instagram handle. So make sure to check that out. And as always, if you have any questions about what Ron and I spoke about today, make sure you're talking with your financial advisor. From New York City, I'm Anthony Pastore. We wish you a great day, everybody. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.